Hi, sorry, small interruption in today's video because I just want to go over two things. Uh, the first thing is that in terms of pronunciation in today's video for languages and tribal names, I've gone with whatever variant I feel is most commonly used in English language. I understand completely that the English forms can seem disconnected from the Greek and Latin forms that these words derive from, but it is what it is. This is an English language video and most of the people that will watch this video will use English as their first language, so yeah. And I'm also going to keep my Brummie accent going throughout. The second thing, and probably the most important thing, is uh, because I wanted to address this as it appeared a little bit in the comments to my Illyrian language video. I just want to say that um, I try to keep all of these videos to the best of my ability, completely free of any politics and ideology. I have no secret agenda going on when I make these videos. I honestly just try to cover the language and the history of the study of the language and put it all together in some format that will be informative and enjoyable for people. And to do that, I try to use researchers who have made the biggest impact in the field and have their work published in some form of peer reviewed format. That's all I've got to say. Back to the video. Like many illustrious names in history, the origin of the Thracians and their language is shrouded in mystery. Join me, Learn Hittite, as I give you the lowdown on what we know about the Thracian language. And maybe along the way, we'll learn a little bit about the Thracians themselves. But actually, it's mainly going to be about the language because, wow, this was one huge rabbit hole. This is the only time I've made a video and I feel like I know less about the language now, having done all the research, done all the editing than I did before. I naively thought this would be an easy video to put together, something like the video that I did on the Illyrian language or the Phrygian language, but no. Putting this together was a massive pain in that. Thrace and the Thracians were first variously mentioned by the classical writers. Famously, in the Iliad, they were allies to the Trojans. Crossland, in 1982, notes that in the Iliad, a homeland is described for a group of people named the Thraces, but also makes the useful observation that the Thraces might have been just the name of one tribe from a larger group of culturally affiliated peoples. This name just evolved in usage to describe the larger tribal grouping as a whole. Crossland also states that Archilochus is the first writer to mention the Thracians as a contemporary people in the 7th century BCE. Researcher Dumitrescu in 1982 states, in his view, that although Indo-Europeanization of the region was certainly complete by the beginning of the Bronze Age, Proto-Thracians of the period were largely indivisible from other Indo-European groups of the region. According to the researcher, it wasn't until the Iron Age that they became a distinct group. Numerous authors have given us the boundaries of Thracian territory. But often, as in the case of Yanakieva, 2018, and Dimitrov, 2009, they are based on the boundaries given by Professor Georgi Mikhailov, and we can see them presented on this map, accurate to the time period of the 6th century BCE. It's also similar to the map given in Mallory and Adams, 1997. The Thracians would have also extended somewhat into the Aegean, at least the islands of Samothrace and Thassos. Researchers also believe that part of northwestern Asia Minor should be included in the Thracian zone, in part due to evidence from ancient authors and onomastic material finds from the region. But remember this map because we're going to be revisiting it in a moment. Yanakieva in 2018 identifies four stages of the development of Thracian language research. So let's take a look at them. Stage one, Wilhelm Tomaszek in 1894 collates for the first time all known sources of Thracian 
and provides an initial overview of the language, pointing to its position as an Indo-European language. Stage two, Thracian linguistic material increases, many new personal and settlement names are discovered. Dimitar Dechev published two key works on Thracian and develops a more comprehensive description of Thracian alongside a deeper analysis of its relationship to other Indo-European languages. Stage three, by the second half of the 20th century, we see further increases in the quality of Thracian linguistic material and the development of theories which split the Thracian branch into two languages, Dacian, sometimes called Dacian Moesian, and Thracian proper. The author doesn't mention this, but Mallory and Adams do in their 1997 work that prior to the late 1950s, Thracian was usually presumed to include Dacian, a language spoken north of the Danube. Stage four covers the last 20 years and the introduction of digitalization of Thracian material. The Thracian linguistic material continues to increase alongside corrections and reanalysis of earlier work. Once more, the author Yanakieva doesn't mention this in her four stage analysis, but I'm gonna add it. The fourth stage of Thracian language research sees academics begin to challenge the concept of Thracian and Dacian forming two separate languages instead seeing them as dialects. Thracian is a partially attested language. Dechev in 1957 collated the first corpus and Dana in 2014 added to it publishing an updated work concerning Thracian personal names. Thracian linguistic relics can be extracted from a variety of sources, including writings by Homer and Hesiod, Greek and Latin inscriptions, coin legends, glosses, and possibly even Linear B tablets, as we'll see later. Some of the inscriptions in the Greek script are actually really chunky, enough that one would imagine that we would be able to draw some reasonably concrete conclusions about Thracian language, but unfortunately that doesn't prove to be the case. With many translations and interpretations being unconvincing at best. One thing that seems to be in agreement in the literature is the Indo-European nature of Thracian. Other than that, there's very little consensus opinion on anything. In fact, to be honest, if there was an Indo-European language somehow connected to the area north of the Aegean, at some point it's probably been speculated to have some sort of connection with Thracian. However, in this video, due to time constraints, we're only going to have a look at some of the few proposed external relationships to Thracian that have the most coverage in the literature, although please be aware that other proposals do exist. In 1983, linguist Gorgiev noted that 50 years prior, many scholars had considered Thracian and Illyrian to be the same language, or at least variants of the same parent language, Thraco-Illyrian. Some even included Phrygian in this grouping, though these ideas soon fell largely out of favor. In the case of Phrygian, it was in part due to some key phonological differences observed, and in the case of Illyrian, presumably because of the sparsely attested nature of both languages, makes it difficult to argue any close relationship conclusively. By the 1970s, the bulk of linguistic work suggested that Thracian might be grouped with another Indo-European language, Dacian, spoken to the immediate north of Thracian. Katitic in 1976 gives a border between these two zones as the Danube, and this idea has been repeated by others. As we mentioned earlier, going over Yanakieva's breakdown of the history of Thracian research, prior to that third stage, Thracian and Dacian had been considered as a whole. Polome, in 1982, observed that scholars considered Thracian to be a single language divided into tribal and therefore geographical zones, with Thracian and Dacian being two of them, with the other tribes including, amongst others, the Migdones, the Dardani, and the Odrissi. 
Ptolemy, however, went on to present evidence contrasting the language of the then Moesia and Dacia regions, termed Daca Moesian, against that of Thrace. In doing so, Ptolemy covered and added to the research by Dechev and Gorgiev concerning the phonological contrast between Thracian and Daco Moesian. Most of these conclusions are debated by other researchers, so we won't go into them in detail here, although I would recommend those interested taking a look at their original work. The crux of the matter, however, can be presented, admittedly in a rather simplified manner, as such. Georgiev notes that south of the Danube, the names of tributaries appear to undergo a consonant shift from Indo-European, whilst north of the Danube, the consonant shift is absent. Ptolemy also gives us a curious toponym distribution pattern, which further illustrates the Thracian contrast to daco -Moesian. Of course, lexical and phonological differences like this are indicative of very little when taken in isolation. However, I do think it shows nicely the contrast between Thracian and Dacian speaking areas, with perhaps Moetian being somewhere in between. The question is, do we observe here two separate languages or merely dialects of one? As we can see, the answer to this question has somewhat flip-flopped during the course of Thracian studies. Broadly speaking, however, Thracian and its external relationships can be demonstrated via one of the two language tree models presented here. That is, Thracian is a single branch on the IE tree with a dialect continuum probably running somewhat north to south. The second model sees a Thraco-Dacian branch, which subsequently splits into Thracian and daco moesian Actually, Semyonov in 1980 proposed a third possible branch, based on the statements of ancient writers and some perceived linguistic differences. However, Yanakieva, in her article on the matter, explored these ideas, but ultimately dismissed them. Whatever model we might favor, even if you fancy Semyonov's idea, it is important to remember that a number of researchers, actually including Polome, Yanakieva and Mallory, amongst others, comment on the limited nature of any conclusions drawn regarding Thracian due to the paucity of evidence we have to analyse. In fact, Mallory and Adams, in the Encyclopedia of Indo-European Culture, 1997, really don't pull their punches, writing that any proposed connection between Thracian and Dacian are largely acts of faith due to the poorly attested nature of both languages, a sentiment I have to agree with. But now actually we need to rewind and go back to this map and add the Dacian territory, because even if you see Dacian as a separate language, it is still likely a very close sibling on the Thraco-Dacian branch. Now we spoke about the Thracian sources, what are the Dacian ones? Well, alongside toponyms and hydronyms, we have the following. Some Dacian plant names are preserved in ancient texts. We have an inscription of a personal name and possibly some words are preserved in Romanian. See the work of Rusu for further details. Now in the following section, we're going to go over some of the characteristics of Thracian, but we'll be considering Thracian as a whole. Some of the specific or proposed differences between Thracian and Dacian we'll look at towards the end. Thracian has the following vowels, attested graphically. A number of authors, including Polome and Duridanov, state that there was a lowering of this late Indo-European vowel. The stop system in Thracian is difficult to determine, although graphically three types and three series are attested. 
The problem with determining the exact value of the stop system iteration lies with the fact that the same personal name is often rendered with contrasting graphical forms. In the literature, however, the following characteristics seem relatively well agreed upon amongst scholars. Apart from the proposed lexical differences discussed earlier, one of the only phonological changes Dacian presents, which is lacking in Thracian, is the change of this late Indo-European vowel into these two diphthongs and this final vowel change we see here. In terms of the grammatical characteristics of Thracian, much is unknown and often the issue is just ignored in some works. Sova in 2020 acknowledges this issue, but also offers a glimmer of hope by presenting to us an example of the dative and nominative case. Take a look at this. We have one inscription featuring the deity name Apollo in the dative case, alongside another inscription with a personal name in the nominative case. Yanakieva offers us one more robust insight into Thracian forms, stating that Ertesa, meaning years, is an example of the nominative and accusative neuter plural. Now let's take a look at some Thracian in action. Sosbergen, in the 1979 text, Thracian personal, ethnic and topographic names in linear A and B states, it may first be observed that in historic times there was an extremely high concentration of names with this nt suffix in Thrace, where it could sometimes be connected with Thracian tribal names. The author then states two personal names found in linear B tablets from Pilos and Knossos may be related to Thracian settlement names. Let's take a closer look, shall we? Here we have the settlement name, which in the Linear B tablets we find as and the second example, which in the Linear B tablets we find as Now at this point in time, I would love to show you some of the amazingly beautiful Linear B tablets that we have pictures of, but unfortunately I can't do that because of reasons. I will, however, be sure to leave links to see these Linear B tablets in the video description. Now let's move on to another example of Thracian, arguably the most famous one, the enigmatic Ezerovo ring. Wojciech Sova in 2020 gives us some background to the ring, namely that it was found in a burial mound near Ezerovo, Plovdiv district. The ring is made of gold and was found with other exclusive grave goods, indicating its occupant was a high class Thracian. The writing is in retrograde, in scriptio continua. Now there have been many, many attempts to interpret, translate the text on this ring. The main hindrance is that it's not obvious how to break down the text into word units. Early attempts at interpreting the text were undertaken by both Gorgiev and Dechev, but neither really gained a following. But in fact, let's take a look at three attempts. We can take a look at the attempt by Dechev via Duridanov. And we can take a look at the translation by Georgiev. And let's throw a more recent translation attempt into the mix. In 2006, Malgozata Zhonkiewicz gave this translation. Which was supported in the same publication by her colleague Krzysztof Wyczak, who executed some further linguistical analysis. Honestly, I had planned to go into some of the analysis by Wyczak, 
but unfortunately I found it quite unconvincing. Or at least no better than the proposal put forward by Georgiev, for example, who at least attempted to justify his interpretation by examining information Herodotus provides concerning Thracian burial customs. But all in all, all three interpretations are missing something. Anyway, many of my subscribers are very knowledgeable linguists, so which of the three interpretations do you think has the most going for it? And in fact, maybe you can come up with your own interpretation. Please feel free to leave your ideas in the comments below. So that brings us close to the end of our investigation of Thracian today. I hope you enjoyed it and found it somewhat informative. The history of Thracian certainly has had many twists and turns and changes in direction. Often when preparing for this video, I would feel I was making progress with my understanding of Thracian when analysing a particular manuscript, only to be put back to square one when reading another Thracian paper from a few years later. What I think can be said is that some of the earlier conclusions or some of the earlier ideas that were disregarded should probably be revisited. For example, the idea that there's no close relationship between Thracian, Illyrian and Phrygian. Wojciech Sober in his 2022 paper kind of briefly touched on this idea and I think it's important to look at because the study of Thracian generally is beginning to move away from some of those early conclusions and assumptions. But you know, in an ideal world, we'll find some kind of big, chunky Thracian bilingual, trilingual, and we'll be able to get a much better understanding of its morphology and come up with some more concrete conclusions regarding its place on the Indo-European tree. But all in all, it's been a fantastic linguistic adventure for me. I do really recommend checking out some of those papers and books that I will list in the video description. Anyway, that's all from me for today. I've been Learn Hittite. You've been fantastic as always. I'll be back very soon with another, hopefully, interesting video. Goodbye for now.